heard about a man that was, uh, he was stranded on a deserted island. And he was out there by himself, and he was all alone on this island. And he'd been out there for years and years and years with no ship, no sign of rescue, no planes going over, nothing going on. And he was sitting out there for many years. And finally, one day, he was walking along the beach, and he looked up at the horizon, and he saw this boat. And he thought, man, this is my time to get rescued. It's finally here. So he goes out there and he sets a fire and, you know, gets the smoke going to try to get a signal to let everybody know that he's out there and he's stranded. And, and it finally, the best thing that could have ever happened to him, the ship sees him. And the ship turns around. He can see it turning around. He sees it starting to come closer. And they end up sending a small boat out to pick him up. And they bring him back. And as he's sitting there in that boat, and he's looking off the side and he's talking to him. They're saying, how did you survive for this many years? How did you, you know, live? And he's telling them about the food that he was able to make and, and, and eat and live on and all this stuff. And then he said he, he was able to make himself a house. And, and he said, in fact, he said, you can see my house that I lived in, the hut that I built. He said, right over there across that ridge. And he pointed at three buildings that he had built, three huts that he had made. And they thought, man, them look really neat. He said, okay, so you lived in one of them. He said, well, what's the other hut that you built? And he said, well, that's my church. He said, I built my church. And he said, because I worship there every Sunday. And they said, man, that's great. Well, what's the third one? And he said, well, that's the church I used to go to. You know, conflict can be found anywhere, amen? It can just be found anywhere, even on a deserted island. In fact, the only ingredients that we need for conflict is us and time to think. Isn't that right? Just us, given a little bit of time to think given a little bit time to chew on stuff and mull things over. In fact, because we have a tendency a lot of times to make a mountain out of a molehill. Have you ever noticed that? Has there ever been anything in your life, any conflict that happened in your life, that once you got past that conflict, you were able to look back and realize that you made a little bit bigger deal out of it than what it had to be? Has that ever happened, or am I the only one? But see, we're, we have that tendency. We have this tendency to make something much larger than what it is. I do not believe, honestly, I don't think for a moment that any of us set out to purposely destroy relationships. I don't think we just wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm just going to set out and I'm going to destroy every single relationship that I have. I don't think that we do. However, oftentimes our demanding self to get our way tends to take over. Isn't that right? Our demanding way to get what we want ends up taking over in things and it ends up uh, getting out of control and it ends up ruining a good thing and eventually relationships are destroyed listen guys the sad truth is having great relationships are very rare having great relationships are very very rare for example we start off our marriage with high hopes don't we we all have this, uh, this, this dream of what marriage is going to look like. We have, this, uh, uh, you know, we have this in mind, and we're just so in love. I mean, everything's perfect. Everything's perfect. You know, everything that she says, everything that he does, oh, it's just so sweet, it's so perfect, and we're all lovey-dovey, and it's just great. And then all of a sudden, six months later, and it's not so perfect anymore. All of a sudden, that easy-to-get-along-with person, the person that just love, we love to get along with, all of a sudden, this easy person's become the most difficult person in the world. Have you ever noticed that? They're difficult. And, and we argue about everything, and we don't th see things eye to eye. And in fact, I think that this person has a lot of issues. And their biggest number one issue is, their biggest problem is they never see things my way. <laughs> Isn't that the biggest problem? They used to think I was cute. They used to just hang on every word, and now they don't like anything I say. You know, we, we step off in that, and then marriage starts falling apart. And then uh, we want to have great relationships with our children. But as our children start getting older, they start taking on personalities of their own. They start taking on, you know, attitudes. They start taking on, you know, this is my life. So they start making decisions on their own. So therefore, we want to have great relationships. But then our children start getting on our nerves so we don't put the time invested in them that we need to. And then the times that we do spend with them end up being a tug-of-war match that just ends in conflict. So we have conflict with our children. And then you know what? We all set off for great relationships in our church, don't we? Man, we finally found the place that we love. This is the place that we can call home. This is the place where I feel I connected. In fact, I love everybody there. They are so amazing. They are so awesome. They're so nice. They're so amazing. Everything's so good until somebody does something that you don't like. Until the preacher says something, or the, they lead the worship, or somebody doesn't say hi to you, or something doesn't happen, or something happens that changes us. And then all of a sudden it's like, hmm, I don't like that church. 
Them are some mean people right there. You know, we get frustrated, we get anger, and then if, instead of everything that we see positive about the church, is now we set it to the side because now all we see is the negative. Now as we see the negative, we don't see all the people coming to the Lord. We don't see the great things that's happening. All we see is that one thing that maybe set us on fire, and it's just made this huge thing. We made that mountain out of a molehill. And then all of a sudden, the people that we once loved are now the most unloving, hypocritical people I've ever seen before in my life. Isn't that what happens sometimes, guys? I mean, hey, I'm telling you, conflict's not a good thing to, uh, to, to, you know, it's not something that I really got excited about preaching on. However, it's something that we all deal with and we all struggle with, so we need to hear the truths of this. So, isn't that how we act sometimes? Amen? Amen. It is. It's just, it is. We, we step off, not intentionally, but our self gets in the way. Listen, guys, as much as I want to, to stay away from conflict, it's actually impossible to completely escape our conflict altogether. It's impossible. There's absolutely no way for us to wake up and live in this perfect paradise all the time. Because you want to know why? People are people. People are people, and we come across people every single day, and, and, and Christians are no different. But however, even though conflict is unavoidable, how Christians go through it is critical. Wouldn't you agree? How we go through conflict is absolutely critical, especially if we want to have any peace in our life. Don't you want to experience peace? Have you ever went through times of conflict and times of peace? Isn't it much better to have peace? Isn't it much better? The conflict just leaves you up in turmoil and, and, and all struggling on the inside. So you know what? We, we started off watching that video uh, just a little bit ago, and it showed you some different thoughts that were going through people's minds. And you know, maybe you can relate to the question that it left us with at the end of the video. And that question is, maybe you're in the middle of a conflict, and that question leaves us with this, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Okay, we find ourselves in the middle of conflict. Where can we go from here? What's next? We're going to find the answers to that question in the Word of God is where we're going to go today. And by the way, aren't you thankful that we can find the answer to whatever it is in life that we're going through in the Word of God? That's how come it's so critical that if we claim to be Christians, if we claim to be believers, we need to be in the Word of God so we can know what His truth says. Because we can find answers to absolutely everything that we go through in the, in the Word. And I'm telling you what, I'm also thankful that the Bible doesn't sugarcoat anything. Because I'm not the sugarcoat kind of guy, if you've ever sat under the preaching long enough, you understand that. Sometimes we just got to have it hit straight on. And I'm thankful that the Bible hits it straight on sometimes. I'm thankful that the Bible was written about real people with real problems to real people with real problems. And it teaches us how to deal with real people with real problems. Amen? Are you a real person? I think I am. That's the, yes, this is the yes. I'm a real person. You know, we're real people. we got real problems, and the Bible discusses this, and it shows us this. So we're going to continue on. Uh, we're going to continue on to the letter to the Philippians that the Apostle Paul wrote from jail. Now, the church at Philippi, it was actually a really good church. The church at Philippi didn't have a lot of problems. However, it wasn't a perfect church. The church was not a perfect church. And can I tell you that no church is? So if you're looking for a, per, a perfect church and you think you found it, please don't join it. Because as soon as you join it, it's not going to be perfect anymore. If it's a perfect church, I promise you, people's not involved. Because as much as we try to follow God, as much as we try to do the right thing, we're not always going to be because we're not infallible. We're not infallible. We make mistakes and we handle things the wrong way. So you know what? The church at Philippi was not perfect either. In fact, I want us to just think of even some of the unique backgrounds. Some of the unique backgrounds. When we first started off on this journey with Philippians, I told you some of the, uh, the people that Paul led to the Lord. But I just want to remind you. Listen to the backgrounds of the first three converts at Philippi. One of them was a sophisticated, wealthy businesswoman. Another one was a career Roman military man. And then the other one, the third one, was a former slave girl who had been part of an occult. Now, isn't that a wonderful combination for conflict to happen? People from all different backgrounds all different walks of life. Just think of this church. Think of everybody differently that we have represented, from poor, poor to middle class to rich, uh, from all different colors to all different shapes and sizes, from all different backgrounds, everything, so we're going to come together. You don't think conflict's going to happen if we're not careful and we don't handle things the right way? Because you know what? The devil is alive. The devil is alive. And if he can sow seeds of discourse, discontent, dis whatever dissatisfaction, if he can make a mountain out of a molehill in our mind, then it's going to happen. 
So we got to be aware of that, and we got to be able to walk this thing out in a God way. So, as these different backgrounds come together at the Church of Philippi, there appears to be maybe a little bit of tension surfacing among the church. Not much, but you know what Paul wants to do? Paul wants to nip it. He wants to nip it. You know the best way to handle conflicts is to nip it right when it happens. Don't let it fester. But he wants to nip this. And, and so Paul, what he does is he urges them to work through their indifferences. He urges them to work through their indifferences in order re to resolve conflicts the right way. And listen to guys, it's very important to understand this. Paul's not talking to believers and non-believers. Paul's talking to Christians. So if you consider yourself a Christian, if you are a born-again, blood-bought saint of God, if you've made a decision to follow Christ, then the book of Philippians applies to you. And this message applies to you because he's not talking to unbelievers because unbelievers handle things the different way than we do. He is talking to believers. So if you fall under that category, he's addressing you right now. So this is for you and this is for me as well. Our, our scripture today is going to be in Philippians 2, 1 through 4. So if you want to find that in the back of your bulletin, or I prefer if you bring your Bible, flip it to that and uh, read it in there. Now, Carrie actually already read the NIV version, which is where, where I'm going to preach from. However, I'm not going to read that one. I'm going to read the message translation because I love the way the message words it. And uh, what the message does, it kind of paraphrases it, and it lets you know exactly what's kind of going on in our language and, and, and talking. So I want to read what Paul says here in the, message, uh, in, in the message translation. And it's on your bulletin as well, too. It says, if you've got anything out of following Christ, if His love has made any difference in your life, if being in community with the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor, agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Isn't that awesome? Man, that just really hits home, doesn't it? People say they can't understand the Word of God sometimes. I promise you, you can understand that. I don't care whether you're a new Christian, a, a Christian that's been walking this, or a seasoned saint. You can understand the way that's worded. Paul says, man, get along. Get along. So if we're going to resolve conflict in a biblical way, then it doesn't start by picking the speck out of somebody else's eye. If I have a problem with Carrie here, it doesn't start with me going over here and starting to tell Carrie every single thing that Carrie's done wrong, does it? If I'm going to resolve this conflict, the very first thing that I need to do is make sure I don't have a log in my own eye. Amen? Because I cannot control you. I cannot control what you go through. I cannot control how you respond to things. I cannot control the way you've been doing things. But what I can control is how I go through it. And what I can control is if there's some things in my own life that doesn't look like Christ, then I need to get them things right. So resolving conflict, first of all, don't think that I'm going to share with you some answers of how to uh, change the person that you're with. The answers to resolving conflict begins in you. It begins in you. It begins in me. As a Christian, we need to examine. The first thing we need to do, we need to take some examinations of our own heart. And the first thing that we need to examine is, number one, you need to examine your relationship with God. You need to examine your relationship with God. Now, how many of you ask yourself this question in the heat of the moment? When you guys are at battle with somebody and you guys got something going on in the heat of the moment, how many of you guys say this when somebody ticks you off? How many of you say, hold on just a second. Hold on just a second. I need to check in with God. I need to check in with God real quick and just make sure that I'm walking in the love of Christ and that His love is working in and through me. How many of you do that? You bunch of sinners. Not a single one of you. <laughs> but don't you think we should? Don't you think when things get heated, if we would just take a step back and say, am I walking in your love, God? Am I doing something? Or how many of us usually say this? How many of us usually end up speaking something that we later regret? Can I see a show of hands then? Yeah, you're my kind of people. We do. We end up saying something that later on we regret and we wish that we got it back. Most of us do the second because we're hard-headed and we don't like being wrong and we don't like losing. Isn't that right? We don't like losing. And you know what? This has been taught to us from a very early age. 
From a very early age, from childhood, we've learned to be competitive. We've learned to be competitive. We've learned to try to win. We've learned to try to go after it. You know, even sitting there watching uh, my kids' little kids' soccer games, you know, they want to win. Everybody wants to win, right? And so they, they're going after it. They're going after the prize, and that trickles over into our life. You know, I'm sitting here even thinking of some hard-headed stuff that I've done in my life. You know, I remember in school, uh, how many of you guys remember playing like bloody knuckles? You know, you'd sit there and swack each other on the knuckles, you know, and you'd try to... And I remember my hand being so swelled up, but I wasn't going to quit. I wasn't going to quit. I wasn't going to be the first one to, to, to give in. We're stubborn. We're hard-headed, and we don't want to lose. Gracie came home, my middle daughter, probably about a year ago, and I was so upset at her. She had this mark all over her hand, and it was red, and it was nasty, and it was all messed up. And I said, what is that all about? And she said, we were playing this eraser game. And I said, what's the eraser game? She said, you rub the eraser on your hand, and the first one that gives up loses. Gracie, why did you do that? And she said, but I won. I don't care whether you won. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. But see, this kind of attitude starts off when we're young, and it just trickles on over into our life. And we want to win. We want to be right. And if there's ever going to be peace and unity, then, guys, somebody needs to surrender. Somebody needs to surrender. Because I'll tell you what, in order to win, somebody else has got to lose. And that's usually where conflict ends up arising. Man, I want to experience peace. Listen, guys, through God's love in Christ is the only force powerful enough to lay down our own pride and our own opinions to resolve conflict. Did you hear that, what I said? Only through God's love in Christ is the only force powerful enough for us to lay down our opinion. That's it. Because based on our own stuff, we're not going to lay down and roll over. We're not going to give up our opinions because our opinions is right. And it's only through that, it's only through God's love that we're able to lay down that, that pride. And listen to this, the Apostle Paul, he pleads with his church. Can't you hear him pleading for unity? He's pray, pleading for the Christians to have unity. He encourages them to examine their own relationship with God in their lives. And he says this in verse 1. He says, if any of you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if there's any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion... He's begging him. He's pleading with him. Guys, listen, it's important to understand as we read this passage, Paul is not using the word if in doubt or uncertainty. So don't look at this as some kind of doubt or uncertainty on what he's using uh, with the word if. And in fact, listen to this, guys. In fact, if is not even in the original text. The actual word that's used here in the translation could be translated since. It could be translated since, not if. So if we read this, it would sound more like this. It would say, Paul would be saying, Listen, Christian, since you have encouragement from being united with Christ, since you have comfort from His love, since you have the same Spirit, since you have tenderness and compassion, then top off my joy by working through your conflicts and getting along. Listen, friend, it isn't, it's so much better getting along. It is. And Paul, that's why he's pleading. He knows if Christians stay in conflict, then God's work's not going to get done. It's not going to get done because we're going to sit around dilly-dallying around with getting our way instead of bringing people into the kingdom of God. And personally, that's what it's all about, is bringing people into the kingdom of God. And the conflict within the church is keeping people from the kingdom of God. It's keeping people away from it. So I want us to, uh, if we're going to do this, if we're going to examine our walk with God, then let's just take a quick look at a few things that Paul addresses here. The first one he's, he's talking about in examining our walk with God is the encouragement in Christ encouragement of Christ. So what's Paul referring to in this uh, encouragement that he's talking about in this word? The Greek word used here is paraklesis, which means one called alongside to help. That's what he's talking about. In John 14, 16, Jesus uses this for the name of the Holy Spirit. So the encouragement that Jesus is talking about here is the encouragement from the Holy Spirit. See, he's saying that in times of conflict, we need to draw our strength from the Holy Spirit. In times of conflict, we need to examine our walk with God. We need to draw strength from the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Because, listen, guys, relational conflicts can be overwhelming sometimes, can't they? They can. They can be overwhelming sometimes. They can be extremely discouraging, especially if the other person isn't responding the way you want to. See, you could want that encouragement. You could want that conflict to be over. But if somebody's not responding the same way, that can be overwhelming sometimes, can it? 
It can be overwhelming sometimes because they're not doing the way you think they should. And sometimes you almost feel like you're banging your head up against the wall because no matter what you say, no matter what you do, the other person is completely unresponsive. Have you ever been there before? Frankly, it begins to wear you out, doesn't it? When it's one-sided, it begins to wear you out. That's why we must tap into the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. It's critical for us to tap into the encouragement of the Holy Spirit because He promised us to never leave us or forsake us. He is our source of hope. We can rely on His strength to live a Christ-like way no matter what the other party involved might do. Operating in Christ's love through encouragement of His Holy Spirit motivates me to do the right thing because it pleases Him. Because it pleases Him. As much as I want the conflict to be over, even if they're not responsive, I'm going to do the right thing because I can find my peace, my encouragement through the strength of the Holy Spirit, and I know when I'm doing the right thing, then God's going to give me that peace that I need in the midst of that, even if they don't respond. But we can also find comfort in Christ's love. He talks about comfort. The word here uh, is used to be, uh, he's talking about finding comfort in time of grief. Finding comfort in time of grief. You know, oftentimes in strained relationships, we can feel that grief. You've been in a strained relationship that is just overwhelming with that grief. You have this empty feeling, this overwhelming sense of loss that sometimes leaves you sad and sometimes it leaves you mad. But we can find comfort in this. When we lean on Jesus, He gives us comfort through His love. And in fact, listen guys, when I think of Christ's comfort that I experience, it reminds me of how much He loves me and how undeserving that I am of His love. Even in the times of my rebellious. And because of that, I can extend that same love to others, even if they aren't deserving. Isn't that what God did to us? He extended His love to us even while we were still sinners. Listen, guys, when we sin, God doesn't cut us off. Aren't you thankful for that? He doesn't cut us off. He doesn't say, you know what, I'm through with you, I don't love you anymore. He doesn't do that at all. In fact, He actually does just the opposite. He ups the intensity of His love by going after us, just like the good shepherd that went after his lost sheep. Guys, listen, the same way our love for others doesn't depend on their response. It all depends on the comforting love of Christ that works on the inside of us. And we need to allow God's love to flow through me, even to the person that offended me, even if I feel like they don't deserve it. Guys, that brings me comfort. That brings me comfort that I know that God's going to be with me right there all the way through it. But then we also need, as we examine our walk with God, our relationship with Christ, we need to uh, share the same spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells in every believer. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says this. It says, For we were baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. The Holy Spirit draws us into fellowship with God, and He draws us into fellowship with all believers as well. Guys, listen. That means that fellowship of the Spirit is always two ways. It's always two ways. The fellowship with the Spirit is me and God drawing, and then it's also me and the other people, the other Christians. So he draws us in two ways, the Holy Spirit does. And it draws towards God and towards other Christians. And in fact, listen to what 1 John 4 through 20 says. It says, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. Whoever claims they love God but hates his brother and sister is a liar. I would say a liar, that's pretty strong words, wouldn't you? And that's what John says. So how can we sit here and claim ourselves to be a Christian and that we love God, but yet we hate our brother and sister in the Lord down the street? Guys, it shouldn't be like that. You and I must rely on the indwelling Holy Spirit to be the oil to lubricate the friction so we can love and get along with one another. The Holy Spirit is present in our life, guys. As Christians, we need to lean on Him to help us through. So if you and I are depending on the Spirit, we will come together. Absolutely will. If me and Carrie's got a problem with each other, and I'm just picking on her because I've already started with this conflict with her (laughs) earlier in the message. But if I have a conflict with Carrie and she has a conflict with me, and I'm leaning on the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit working inside of me, and she's leaning on the Holy Spirit, and we're trusting that the Holy Spirit's working on each other, then you know what we're going to do? The Holy Spirit's going to bring us together in unity. He's absolutely going to because the Holy Spirit will not divide us. He'll bring us together. He'll bring us together. So as Christians, we need to depend on the work of the Holy Spirit. And even if the Holy Spirit, uh, even if, if somebody is not 
responding to us, we still need to trust God in the process. So the last thing we need to be aware of when examining our relationship with God is our compassion in Christ. Our compassion in Christ. Is our compassion level for others in the area that it should be? Is our compassion in the area for other people to where it should be? You know, this points to an emotional level of God's love. In Matthew 9, 36, Jesus, he's sitting there on the hillside, and he looks over the multitude, and the Bible says that he felt the compassion for them because they were distressed, downcast, and like sheep without a shepherd. I am so thankful, I'm so thankful that God didn't look at me and say, Brent, you're a stupid sheep. You're a stupid sheep. It serves you right to suffer because you're a sinner. Aren't you glad he didn't say that to you too? Listen, guys, thank you, Lord, for having compassion on me. And because of this, we are to have compassion and tender mercies for sinners, uh, even if we don't think that they deserve it, even if we don't think they deserve it. Listen, church, all this boils down to the fact that when conflicts arise, we need to examine our relationship with Christ. It should be an opportunity to learn more about Christ and becoming more like him. Guys, we become more like Christ when we go through tough times, if we lean on him. So through conflict, it should be a door open to learn who God is, to learn who Christ is, to look more like him. Did someone offend you? You know what? Jesus was treated offensively, wasn't he? But he still loved him. Did someone run over your feelings? You know what? Jesus knew that kind of treatment also. Did your friends leave you in your time of need? You know what? The disciples left Jesus in his trial and his crucifixion. Did a close friend betray you? You know what? Jesus was betrayed by Judas, right? So Jesus, Jesus can sympathize and knows what we're going through. Relationships are challenging, and they can go south really, really, really quick if you're not careful, guys. So the next time you feel mistreated, unloved, or betrayed by a family member, a friend, a co-worker, or a fellow Christian, I want you to examine your relationship with Jesus. I want you to draw close to him and ask yourself if you are operating in Christ's love. If you're operating in Christ's love, Listen, guys, are there any adjustments that you need to make when it comes to your relationship with God? And then to resolve conflicts, number two, we need to examine our attitude. We need to examine our attitude. When it comes to conflicts, you have to get real and ask yourself this question. Are you seeking unity or are you seeking your own way? You just have to ask yourself that question and you have to get real with yourself. Am I seeking unity or am I seeking my own way? You know, if we have an attitude that it's bent on getting our own way, then conflict will never be resolved. If we have to have our own way, then conflict will never get resolved. In verse 2, Paul says this. He says, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and one in mind. The word mind here is actually the verb, and it can be translated that you think the same thing. That you think the same thing. It gives the idea of having the same attitude. That's what this is all about. It's having the same attitude. It's the idea of having the same attitude. It's the common theme throughout Philippians. The common theme is joy. And Paul is saying here that there's a direct connection between joy and having the right attitude when it comes to relationships. There's a common thread there. Paul doesn't say, hey, my joy will be filled to the brim if I get out of prison, did he? He didn't say, hey, I mean, his joy was coming from his walk with Christ. But he didn't say, hey, it'd be overflowing if I get out. What he did say is my joy will be filled to the brim if the Philippians would be like-minded and share in the same attitude when it comes to love and harmony. If we would have that same attitude when it comes to love and harmony, then Paul's going to get excited. Because he understands how it can tear it up and how it can fall apart. It's all about the attitude, guys. Sometimes we think good relationships happen by accident. We do. We look at a husband and wife and a great family that seems like they're getting along, and the first thing that we want to say is, man, then people sure are lucky. Man, they're lucky to have that kind of a relationship, to kind of have that. And then we start looking at our own marriage, and we're not so happy. And then we begin to think, you know what, maybe we just weren't meant to be. Maybe it's time for to find somebody a little bit more compatible. Can I tell you guys, whatever the relationship is, whether it's marriage, whether it's a parent-child, whether it's a friend, whether it's co-workers, whether it's church, Whatever it is, good ones are not a matter of luck. They're not a matter of luck. They're not a matter of natural compatibility. They are built on a mindset of having an attitude that works to seek unity. It's built on an attitude that seeks unity. This doesn't just happen by random chance. These kind of relationships, they're intentional and they're on purpose. So we have to be intentional about our relationships. We have to be on purpose about them. 
So there's a few areas that Paul gives here to the Christians if we're going to do this while we're examining our attitudes. He says this, to resolve conflicts, we need to be in the same mind. Literally means you think the same thing. However, don't confuse this with the idea that we all see everything, uh, every matter the exact same way, because that's impossible. We are all going to see circumstances different. We're all going to. So he's not saying that we're supposed to think the same thing, that you know what, you just have to line yourself. That's where the conflict comes from. When I'm saying you have to see things my way. That's not what he's talking about when it comes to thinking things the same way. And I also want us to understand that he's not meaning that we lay aside essential truth of the gospel just to get along. He's not saying, hey, put the Bible to rest just to get along. He's not saying that either. What Paul is saying, he's saying that our minds need to be focused on Christian love. And as we grow in our understanding of God's Word, then we'll begin to possess the mind of Christ. And when that happens, we'll share a common approaching, uh, our common way in approaching conflicts. Listen, guys, the approach is different than the world tells us. You know, the world tells us, you know, get whatever you want, have your way, your way is the right way. But God says we need to deny ourselves and to seek to please God and to love others. We need to seek God to please Him and love others. And when we come to second, uh, and when it comes to two Christians having the same mind, then we have the basis of working through conflict. And verse two tells us that we also need to have the same love. You know, this kind of goes hand in hand with the same mind. You know, if we have this, as we have the same mind in striving for unity, then it is because we have the same love for uh, each other. You know, just like the lyrics of the song that we we sang up here. You know, it says love will hold us together. You don't have to agree with me on everything, but if we are like-minded, if we have the same mind when it comes to unity and seeking the right attitude and love, then you know what? That love's going to hold us together. It's going to be the bond for each of us to see some things different. But we don't have to divide over them. Amen? We don't have to divide over them. We can see some things different, but we can still seek unity. It's about having the right attitude when it comes to that. But then he also talks about being united in the Spirit when it comes to our attitude. This literally means one in soul. Listen, guys, again, true unity is not automatic. It's not a matter of luck. True unity is a matter of the heart. We must deliberately decide to set our minds on being one and though, with those who truly know Christ, even if we don't like them or even if we don't agree with them on everything. What we do have in common is Jesus Christ. So we need to put our differences to the side and seek love and seek Christ and seek unity and have that right attitude. Listen, guys, if we examine our attitudes in the mix of conflict, then we'll strive to be united in the Spirit with the same mind, the same love, and then we will have the same purpose. And that purpose is exalting Christ. That's the whole purpose is to exalt Christ. And that means by getting along with our fellow Christians, exalting needs to be more important than having my own way. Exalting Christ needs to be more important than me getting my own way. When's the last time you examined your attitude when it came to conflicts? Or are you just all obsessed by the other person's attitude? Guys, we need to examine our own attitude. To resolve conflicts, we also, number three, is we need to examine your motives. Examine your motives. I want you to ask yourself in the midst of conflict, are my motives selfish and conceited, or are they humble and pure? Are my motives selfish and conceited, or are they humble and pure? Listen, guys, when your motives are wrong, you'll begin to experience conflicts in several areas of your life. You know, if you're somebody right now that... It just seems like drama just seems to follow you. (laughs) Everywhere I go, there's drama. It just seems to follow me. You know, maybe you're inviting it. If drama seems to follow you, maybe you're inviting it. If every single conflict, if every single relationship in your life is strained, if every single area, every single relationship is strained, you know what the common denominator is? You. You See, guys, this is part of examining yourself. It's part of examining your own heart. It's it's part of examining your motives and making sure that your motives are right. Listen to what Paul says in verse 3. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, conceit, rather in humility, value in others above yourself. The selfishness that Paul is referring to here is to campaign for office. That's what he's talking about, to campaign for office. You know, um, How many of you are excited 
is that all the political ads that are going to be starting here before too much long. Aren't you just excited that? Don't that pump you up? Don't that just get you excited to see the Democrats talk about how bad the Republicans are and the Republicans talk about how much the Democrats and, and run each other's party down just to build up your case? Aren't you excited about that? I always feel so rejuvenated and you know, revived listening to them. Or does it wear you out? It wears you out. See, that's what this word selfishness is talking about. It's talking about to campaign for office. It's talking about, it gives the picture of you have to tear somebody else down to build yourself up. Isn't that what they do in the campaign ads? They tear somebody else down to build themselves up. And Paul says, hey, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's not be selfish by, by tearing somebody else down to build ourselves up. You know, uh, often, a lot of times, we sit here and we even get a chuckle out of it. We're like, no, I didn't like them campaign ads. Don't like that at all. We get a chuckle out of that. However, you know what? We act like the same thing. We act like the same thing so often. You know, we operate the same way. We sit around and we run others down in order to build ourselves up. And anybody that will lend us an ear, then you know what? Hey, well, so-and-so did this and somebody did this. And next thing you know, it's like, man, I agree with that. And you know what? I know somebody else that was experiencing that too. And then they're coming over here. It's like a little magnet. And then you've got all these people that you're starting to share in common ideas with. And you've got all these people that are following you now that's lending you an ear. And can I tell you that the Apostle Paul refers to this as vain conceit and vain glory. And vain glory. Listen to this, guys. In other words, we puff our own selves up and we fall under the control of pride. Conflicts arise, tempers flare, words are exchanged, arguments are had, wrong actions are taken, people take sides, forgiveness is withheld, and because of that, relationships are ruined, husbands and wives divorce, families fall apart, business partnerships are split, Christians can't stand each other, churches are divided, and glorifying God is the last thing on anybody's mind. But yet we're Christians. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't that right? Isn't that right, guys? Guys, it's got to stop. How's your motives? Paul says, let's keep them pure. Let's value others above yourself. So the last thing we need to do to resolve conflicts is number four, is you need to examine your view of others. How are you looking at other people? You need to examine your view. Are you putting the interest of others above your own self? You know, Paul says this in verse four. He says, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. You know, oftentimes, we find ourselves being short on patience when it comes to other people, but we make excuses for ourselves, don't we? We have a short of patience with somebody else, but we make excuses for ourselves. For instance, for instance, when the guy in front of us in the express checkout lane has five items too many and he writes his check instead of paying cash, we get frustrated with him for being inconsiderate, don't we? Because he's slowing us up and he's inconsiderate. However, however... If we do that, if we do that, you know, we're in a hurry and we've got a real good reason. Or how about when my wife's running late or she's behind? It's because she didn't plan her time very good. But you know what? When I'm running late and I'm behind, it was because of circumstances beyond my control. Or how about when your kids lose something? It's because they're irresponsible. But yet when I lose something, it's because i got a lot on my mind. Do we need any more examples, or do you guys get the picture? You know, we run a, we can we can so often fall into that, guys. We can be so selfish, and most of the times we don't even realize it. We can be so selfish, and most of the time we don't even realize it. We're like a fish in the water, who don't know they're wet. Isn't that good? We're like a fish in the water that don't know they're wet. That's not original. That's not mine, but I like it. You know, that's how we live. We live in a selfish world, and we act selfish, but a lot of times we don't even realize it because it's somebody else. Guys, the Bible says we need to put other people first. And I know that life can be busy, and I know we can find ourselves getting pulled several different directions, and sometimes it can be almost overwhelming at times. And we sit here and think, listen, preacher, how can I possibly put somebody else above myself right now whenever I don't even have time? You know, I don't believe that Paul's saying that, that uh, we are to never say no to the demands in life. Because sometimes, you know, things are demanding and sometimes people want our attention and sometimes they want to pull us and sometimes we do have to say no. You know, Jesus said no sometimes. He withdrew to the crowd, from the crowds and he spent time with God the Father. Sometimes he withdrew with the twelve just so he could train them. 
We all have responsibilities that demand our time. So I don't mean, believe that Paul just meant that we're supposed to let people walk all over us and we're supposed to do everything that everybody wants all the time. But what I do believe that this does mean is that Paul's saying that we need to consider other people's needs and their interests in everything that we do. We need to consider other people's needs and their interests. It's about setting our focus, shifting our focus from us to others. See, that's how come we go through things, because we got our, our, our focus all fi uh, fixed on ourselves. And, and Paul's trying to get us to shift it from us to somebody else. He's trying to get us to see it in another perspective. Instead of just thinking it from my own, we need to consider what other people's going through and what their interests are. Listen to guys, thinking about it from another perspective, if we try to think of it from other people's lay, uh, way, especially in the area of conflict, you know, what if instead of us being mad at somebody, what if we tried to remove ourselves for just a second and think about how they're feeling? Put their interest above us. Maybe think about it from their angle. Maybe think of it from their side. Maybe we could get just a little bit different uh, side. I told somebody a little earlier, and I've said this before, you know, it takes an awful thin pancake to have one side. Usually our conflicts aren't all just the other person's fault. Usually there's some ownership that we can take in it as well, too, if we would start our examining ourselves. You know, this is honestly, it's the golden rule principle in action. How would I feel if I were him? How would I want to be treated? You know, that's how I need to treat others. Paul is saying, consider others, not just yourself. I'm going to ask Carrie and the praise band to come on up as we close this. Think of others, not just yourself. So let's wrap this up, guys. I want to take us back to that video that we started with and all the different conflicts that were going on, all the different things that were going through them people's had. And I want us to go back to the end of, the quest, the end of that uh, with that question. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? You know, the answer is simple. We need to examine our relationship with God. We need to examine our attitude, examine our motives, and examine our view of others. However, doing this, doing this is a lot easier said than done. Amen? We can have all the answers, we can fill in the blanks, but then actually applying them to our life is a lot harder. And for this to happen, for this to happen, the only way for this to happen is someone needs to die. And it's not the person you're mad at. Someone needs to die, and that person is you. If you're going to resolve conflicts, when you examine yourself, someone needs to die. Listen, listen. For every believer, for a believer, the Bible says this. Galatians 2.20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And then in Luke 9.23, Jesus says this. He said to all, if anyone could come, would come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross daily and follow me. Take up the cross daily and follow me. And then in Galatians 5.24, Paul says this, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and, the, and its passions and desires. Are you willing to die to self so that conflict can be resolved? It's not going to happen unless somebody takes that step. And since you're here and since you're listening, guess who's got to take the first move? Guys, I want us to stand at our feet. You know what? I'm just going to get, I'm going to get real with you. You know, there's a, I'm standing up here preparing this message this week. This is the way God does things, guys. There's a couple people that don't like me too well in this town. And there's conflict. And it tears me up. It rips my heart out, and it hurts. But you know what? Through studying this, and through being in this, God shows me things, and He shows me steps that need to be taken to resolve things. Guys, preachers aren't exempt from things happening. And you know what? I'm going to apply all these principles, and I'm going to take these steps. And even though I feel like I've taken steps, I'm going to take more steps. Because I'm going to die to self. I'm not going to stand up here and preach and be a hypocrite. If I'm not able to stand up here and do it, if I'm not able to walk it out, then I don't want to do it either. I don't want to stand up here. 
Guys, it takes every single one of us to just kill in the pride, laying it down. Let Christ live in and through us. So relationships, marriages, conflicts, churches, all that stuff can be put together and can be mended and can be healed. I don't care if it's your fault or not. The Apostle Paul says, much as it depends upon myself to be at peace with all men. So I'm going to take one more step in making peace. But how they respond, I have no idea. But you know what? I still have the encouragement and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit lives with inside of me, and He's going to comfort me, and He's going to take care for me. All He wants me to do is take steps. So I'm going to ask you today. I give you some faith in action questions. That's your homework assignment. I'm going to read them off to you. Is there anyone that you need to ask for forgiveness from? Is there anyone that you need to forgive? And number three, what steps are you going to take this week to restore a strained relationship that you're going through? Guys, this is how Christians deal with it. Let's be a church. Let's be a church that really, really, really tries to set things straight in our relationships, in our walk with other Christians. It's very, very important. Because I'm telling you what, unforgiveness will tear us up. It's bitter and it's ugly. And love will hold us together. It's coming together in the same mind, the same unity. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes for just a second. Guys, for one thing, it's impossible to do this without the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit doesn't live inside of you unless you've invited Him into your life. So I'm going to ask you this question right now. If you are going to stand before the Lord Jesus face to face this afternoon, and He said to you, why would I let you into my heaven for? What would you say? Would you say, oh, because I went to church this morning? Would you say, because I'm a good person? Would you say, because I do better than my neighbor down the street? I'm not like that heathen. What would you say? The Bible says the only way into heaven is to confess the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says, if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. And there's so many people that the Bible also says, not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they say, hey, didn't we prophesy? Didn't we do many wonderful things in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Because, see, I tell you what, there's a lot of people that think they're born-again believers, but they're not. They're not all in. They've never accepted Jesus. They've accepted like a, a fairy tale. So if you want to be all in today and you don't know that you are, everybody's heads bowed and everybody's eyes closed, raise up your hand and say, I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior.